Uh, good evening, Jean Poisson. Have I got that right? Spot on, my friend. Spot on. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it must be because I've travelled the world with my band. That's another. That's another. We'll have a discussion for another day. And so I have. Um, and, and I do remember on my MBA, uh, there was quite a few French people. So um, uh, your name did strike me. Um, right before I um, before we go into why we're speaking, um, let me just tell you what the stats say about people who attend meetings. Um, they say um, they hate it when people arrive late, but some of them say a bad meeting is so bad they would prefer rather than go to a bad meeting, they'd rather go to the dentist, they'd rather talk politics at a family dinner. They also say um, that during COVID, the number of weekly meetings has gone up by 10%, and that's three additional meetings per week per employee. Now, we all have to have meetings, whether we have meetings at home, whether we have meetings because we're a non-exec director and for governance reasons, we have to have a meeting. We may also have a meeting because that's part of the business you're in and you have a meeting to improve the business performance. So Jean, today we're gonna to be talking about what to watch out in a meeting, what are the little clever tricks that you can learn and techniques you can learn to make a meeting more productive? Uh, productive. But before I go into all of that, let me kick off and say, Jean, why am I speaking to you? Why have people said to me, you're the man to speak to when it comes to understanding how a board functions? And let me just before you say that, let me just tell you that one of the other reasons I, I had to come and reach out to you. I read your article. Um, around communication skills for a meeting in a boardroom. And it has been received so fantastically. I know this podcast is gonna be hit, even if I just end up just reading out of the magazine. So far away, John, why am I talking to you? Well, firstly, th th thank you for inviting me. And uh, essentially I'm an ex-banker, but it doesn't make me a bad person. So my formative years were about assessing, assessing risk in businesses. And I've been privileged to see many good businesses, saddened to see some catastrophes, some terrible ones. And as, as formative years, these things actually help you develop an antenna and a skill, perhaps to, to spot a good business from, from a bad business. Uh, for the last 25 years or so, I've been working with boards and companies all over the world. I've worked in over 30, 30 countries. In a typical year, I would, over, I would interact with about six to 700 directors of, of businesses of all sizes, and I'd work with about eight to 10 boards. So basically what was in my article was, I guess, my experiences, my observations. Um, I don't, I don't uh, proclaim to be an expert in communication or governance or board dynamics, but this is just from the gut. That's pretty much what I see, what, uh, what I've observed. And the fact that the article got some good uh, traction would suggest that perhaps I was on the button on some of these things and in terms of s some of these observations. So I guess that's why we're here. We, we are a small advisory firm and we like to think that we have a very practical approach to things where we'd like to share the benefits of our experience um, as we sort of contribute to knowledge with our clients. You know, it, it works both ways. It, it works both ways. Okay, so let's let's pick up some typical meetings. A meeting could be where everybody sat around the table is very well known to you. So you understand what makes them tick. It could be a meeting where you're the outsider who's just joined them. So you could be a new non-exec director. Mm -hmm. Or it could be a meeting actually where no one's met no one and you've all been brought together. And I think irrespective of which of those meetings is taking place, you can, as you've said, Jean, you can spot the behavior. You can see the words. And sometimes meetings are totally ra rail railroaded because of the dominance of some of these characteristics. So let me pick up from the article, some of the brilliant stuff. So, so you said uh, there, are, there are things to watch out for when a board member speaks. And, and, and you say, you call them the dangerous, the too predictable, 
prefaces. So you say, be careful of someone who starts with a sentence, research has shown. <laughs> why, why should we worry about someone <laughs> in a meeting, any kind of meeting who starts with the words, uh, research has shown. Well, the fact is, um, and again, it's interesting your, your, your earlier part to that, um, particularly a board meeting. When you walk into a board meeting as a new appointed director, non-executive director, you're walking into a collage of codes, of behaviors that you don't know. And if you're a non-executive director, you'll have a meeting maybe four or five times a year, if that so it's, it will take you time to adjust to understand what's going on there to be able to contribute and navigate through all this. But my point about research has shown is this. You, you go to, and it doesn't have to be a board meeting, it can be anything. And somebody says, research has shown, and it has near biblical authority. And I hope I'm not offending anyone's faith or kind of lack of faith here. Research has shown, therefore it is accepted as a fait accompli that therefore it is. And Many years ago, I kind of learned this when I was asking, well, would you, would you mind pointing it out to me? What, what research are we talking about here? Not to be smug or to, not to catch people out. I just wanted to know. And I promise you, time and time again, people cannot back it up. And it's not being, they're not being malicious. They're not being sort of nasty. But somewhere it got in there that there's a piece of research out there somewhere. And therefore, if I say research has shown, that's my argument wall. And I think any good chair or any good director or, be, or, any, or any person who says that should be able to back it up. And the research which I'm talking about here is da 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 End of discussion on that one. So, so why might someone say that and, and, and then not be able to back it up? What's their rationale for saying and research has shown that? Look, sometimes it's mischievous. Sometimes they're smart enough to know if I say that, no one's going to question me on it. But I think for, for, for most cases, people actually believe in that. Uh, it, and it could have emanated from a corridor conversation. Somebody should have said something. And it's, and it's gone in the toolkit that, that, oh, there's research on this without even going to then check it out. So they, they actually, they believe that this research which actually supports their point. And it's a strong point to make. If I say research has shown, boom, job done, basically. So I think uh, there's possibly a little bit of malice, but I think in most cases we've heard, we've picked it up. I mean, I mean, I call it, or psychologists call it mental anchoring. You know, I've made up my mind. Somebody told me something somewhere, somehow, and it's in the toolkit and therefore it is. And as a consequence, I'm not open to any conversations to critique, to question, to query, or to maybe think differently. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a case of co as often common practice becomes common sense. I, I, could it also be that um, if somebody's on dodgy grounds, if they say, according to research, they mm -hmm. do work on, as you said, the probability that nobody in that room mm -hmm. is going to ask them that Absolutely. research? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and there's another one that people use a lot. People say things like 80% uh, of acquisitions fail. Now, that is one hell of a statement to make. 80% um, is a huge, huge, huge number. And of course, what do we mean by fail? What kind of time period are we looking at here? Now, if that statement were to be moderated to say a very high percentage of acquisitions fail to achieve their intended objectives in the planned intended timeframes, then it's a bit more robust. But those absolute statements and people say, oh, most acquisitions fail because of culture. Okay? That's culture right. is a factor. They do say yeah. that. They do say yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Show me the research. Show me, show me the facts. And, and they can't. And they can't. Because, because they can't. <laughs> Well, now, well, culture is a factor, don't get me wrong, it is a factor, but to pin that on an absolute number of 80% and to speak, you see, when you see, and we'll talk about numbers later, I'm sure, when you talk about numbers and precision, it adds gravitas to the argument. Well, I, <laughs> this is going to make me smile because 
<laughs> I've been in a lot of meetings recently where actually everybody is, is saying that continuously. Oh, listen, listen, if we merge with X, Y, and Z, you know, culturally it will fail. The research shows. Actually, they've used both those terms. They've said, oh, the research shows that these things fail. And, and in fact, I never thought about mm -hmm. asking for which research. Mm -hmm. and, and the big one, uh, they keep saying, it's the research shows that because of culture, mergers don't work or acquisitions don't work. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I must concede, I've been in that board meeting when I've, I've accepted, because I've heard it so many times mm -hmm. from so many different people. Common, common practice becomes common sense. Now, you, you, you say in the same article, look out for someone who says, when I was at, so they start with, but when I was at, and what, what did you mean by that? Well, you, you know, Linda, all of us have a, a managerial toolkit of sorts. We, like a doc, like a medical doctor, he or she knows what to look out for and how to treat certain symptoms, yeah? When you get COVID-19, nothing like that before. Okay, we've had flu, obviously, and we've had kind of SARS type flu. So there is a little bit of a precedent, but new circumstances force new diagnoses and new vaccines. It's the same in business. When somebody says, when I was up, you see, we're all prisoners of our own experience. I mean, I call it the curse of knowledge, where uh, the knowledge that I had on a problem of 10 years ago may not work now. It might. The context is different. And that's why in sports, so, so, so often, when a coach leaves a club and he or she goes and does other things with their lives and they come back, it's rarely the same second time around because the club has moved on. The context is different, you know? Uh, and if the context, you see, uh, experience is great as long as the future resembles the past, right? If the future resembles the past, experience is to be cherished. Of course it is. Yeah. And, and you want that experience. But very often it is not. It is not. So if I'm applying a toolkit on something which I saw 10 years ago, th those remedies may not travel. And I think it's about being conscious as a director that uh, and, 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 and accept that not everything will travel. The context is different. Some will, but I think that's why we have to have an open mind on that. And uh, the one I've heard a lot, uh, and by the I've heard that one as well. When <laughs> I was at Company X, yeah. we did this. When I was at Company Y, we acquired X, X Y, mm -hmm, and Z. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Company Z, I've done 400 mm -hmm. acquisitions. And you hear this all the time. I tell you where you hear it a lot. I don't give a listen to Clubhouse, it's a social platform, good grief. Mm -hmm. That's all I hear when I was at. Um, but, but what about when there are decisions to be made at the board and people start with the word, I think we should do this. What's the problem behind when people say, I think we should do this? Okay. Well, it's a case of what's driving think. Is it experience? Is it background? Is it precedent? Is it analysis? Is it data? Is it as a result of? That's what I need to know. That's what I need to know. Uh, I, I, in the article, I quote a, a friend and a colleague of mine, the barrister, yeah. and, he always, and he always tells a story. The first time he presents in court, a bit nervous, and his boss is behind him in court, and he says, Your Honor, you're a judge. I don't know how they addressed in, in court. I'm not au fait with court protocol. And he said, I think, he said, Jean, I didn't even get to finish my sentence. The judge said, counsel, I don't care what you think. Present the argument. And he said, and I could hear my bosses laughing behind that because they, <laughs> they got caught as well. He said, it's, it's a lesson I never, ever, ever, ever forgot. Ever forgot that lesson, I think. And, oh, hang on a second here. We want a bit more certainty here. You know, Look, we all have opinions and, that, and that's fine. But when, when people speak with authority, I think we should do this. And one question which I always ask when we do board evaluation is, on what basis were those decisions made? Who made the decision to buy, to sell, to brand, to rebrand, to cut? Who actually made that decision? And what was 
the background that led to that decision being being uh, being first talked about and ultimately actioned upon. So I think it's experience talking, which is which is often very good, by the way. We need a bit more science, so to speak, uh, uh, to get behind that. Um, I, I've got to confirm that. I, I can now. I'm now trying to remember. Or every time I hear someone has said some of this stuff, and, and no one's asked a question. Uh, the, the, the one I classically recognise, uh, and we see it all the time in debates on TV, is mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. someone starts with the word, with all due respect. Uh, and, and I mean, <laughs> I mean, everybody must have had somebody say to them, but with all due respect. So, but we know what's coming, don't we? We know what's coming when someone says to you, but with all due respect. What's coming then, John, when somebody says that? What are they, what are they trying to do? That means an excess F missile is coming. That's what that means. <laughs> so don't say it. Because now I think we're all smart enough to know. When somebody says, with all due respect, that means we're going to have a fight here. That's what that means. We're going to disagree on some things. Don't say it. Don't say it. You know, boards or meetings don't have to be comfortable places. It's okay to disagree, you know? And as we keep telling people, be hard on the issue if you have to, but be soft on the individual. We can still go out afterwards and have a drink and have a chat. You know, we just, we just disagree. It happens. So, John, do, but do people, I mean, you said people dis- disagree, but is that why people use with all due respect? Because they know if they say that, they're softening or they're trying to soften what they really mean. Right. And they're trying That's to right. make the person who's going to hear your remark mm except that, uh-oh, here it comes, but they're being very polite about it. Yeah, that's right. Except that preface is so laced with irony and it's, <laughs> it is so laced with disrespect that, you know, it, it, it has long service purpose. I mean, I've seen chairs with a smile or directors with a smile and with a very gentle mannerism say things like, Ninda, we're going to have to disagree on this. Oh, that's okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. You know, as opposed to actually the, the bombastic approach, I'm right, you're wrong. You know, the, this is not a winning situation. We just happen to have different viewpoints. And that's fine. And, and on the board or in it, you cherish that in the board. You absolutely cherish the diversity of thought, the diversity of opinions. I mean, that's really, really good. And it's helpful. And, and it's really, really helpful. So there are other ways of meaning the same thing, I think. So that uh, this with respect, I think people should stop saying it in truth because it, it's almost offensive. And, 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 and if someone, I, I tell you, I tried it this morning with someone and I said, I've got a podcast later with Jean and he's going he's gonna to pick up a line called with all due respect. And the person on the other side of the phone fell about laughing and said, yeah, that's in- incredibly insulting because you know what's yeah. coming. Yeah, and, and, and that person said, yeah, you, you, you know exactly what's coming. Yeah, of course you I mean, I, 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 was, uh, I was working in Russia. Uh, I used to go to Russia a couple of times a year. And uh, now we do it virtual. And uh, the Russians, as you can imagine, have a very direct style of, de- yeah. of debating, shall we say. And the first time I saw a board meeting, I thought, these guys are going to kill each other. So, such was the or my perception of the ferocity of the argument, but in fact, it was just the way they are. And uh, so I got friendly with quite a few of them. And the one guy said to me, Jean, you know, I have a problem with one director. They go on them, and he was telling me, We disagree. I said, Anatoly, are you married? Just, just. And this is a guy in his 50s. You love your wife? Just, 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 just. Very much, very much. Do you sometimes disagree with your wife? Ha, ha, ha. All the time, all the time. So who wins the argument? He said, Well, sometimes I win. Sometimes she wins. I said, sometimes you let her win, and sometimes she let you win. Ha, ha, yes, I said, you still love her, don't you? Yes, yes, yes. But you, it, it took you to disagree. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you disagree on it? And either, but, but it, it's the, uh, your earlier point, either, it's the behavior. It's the manner of the disagreement, which is important. You know, and, and, and I think with respect, it's just, you're quite right, it's insulting. In truth, and it's it, it's a bit amateurish. In truth, I think you know if, if you're going to insult somebody, do a good job at it. 
I, I thought I thought it was very interesting, and, and and hopefully we'll have time to pick this up. It is the way you said the body language. Instead of the words, let the body language do the work. And when you said smile and say we agree to disagree, mm -hmm. the body language is more powerful than the words you use because actually oh, gosh, yeah. the smile oh, yeah. the smile said it. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, people like Ronald Reagan. People like JFK, people like Clinton, people like Obama, they have this capacity to make you feel like you were the most important person in the world. Look, I've never met them, but speaking to people. And some leaders have that ability. You know, they, they're humble, they, they sort of learn from people, they, they're respectful. Uh, it's the smile, it's the kind of, it's the easygoing body language, as opposed to the aggression as opposed to the kind of facial movements, which, which, which don't help, really, which really, really don't help. So, and I think, and it's amazing how, and you see, especially directors or senior leaders, if people don't tell them that they have a problem with language, with communication, with body language, they're going to carry on doing it. Because, you know, and, and especially, I mean, uh, I see chief executives or senior leaders they tell a joke and everybody laughs. Yeah. So, so they think they're funny and, and they keep telling jokes because nobody would have the temerity to go and tell the great person that actually your joke telling, maybe you should, maybe it's, it's, it's kind of not funny. You're actually offending. People, don't, we don't tell them those things. And as a consequence, the behavior is, it, it keeps happening. It just keeps happening. And that's why, sorry, you do need a good chair, a good chair, or a team leader reads the room. They read the room, where people sit, how people behave. And a good chair after a board meeting should phone every single board member. So how did you think the board meeting went the other day? You know, And a question I often ask chair when I, we do board evaluation is to ask the question, okay, you've had a board meeting and good practice recommends that you should phone each and every board member. Do you have a priority list? I, who do you phone first? Or is, is it just a random set of calls? Now, good chairs are really oh, no, I have my priority. Maybe one person was a bit quiet. I could see one person seemed a bit unhappy with that. That person should read the room all the time and uh, bring on members who they feel perhaps, for whatever reason, are not contributing today. Or for whatever reason, I mean, I've had cases working with people where I was, I was at TSP many years ago uh, and I used to run the management college, which is in Solihull. You know, I, I worked there for about three years and I was, I was in my last appointment, I was director of studies. And we knew this chap who worked for the bank and we had dealt with him, you know, and he was a fan of nice guy. And he came on a course and he was just bad news. You know, he was negative, he was unpleasant. Uh, almost toxic, he was corrupting the atmosphere, and I thought this is the start of him I had never seen before. And you know, you talk to him and everything, and I thought, no, something's there's something here. So I phoned his peer, who thankfully I knew, and I said, Look, I've had certain on the course, and he said, Well, and this guy in his 30s, his wife had cancer, and he says, and it was pretty bad. And there was a possibility that, you know, mortality was a possibility. Young family, I got it. And when I spoke to him, I said, you know, Paul, you know, I'm really sorry to hear about your issues. And, you know, uh, and my dad died of cancer and, you know, finished, different person. He, he was angry with the world. He was angry with life. And that forum gave him an outlet. Uh, so, so almost, John, you, you're talking about having empathy, not only as a chair with your board members, but your board members should have an empathy with other people around the table, because if they have that, then you're gonna to come to a better collective decision. Of course you do. Because you're on the, not the same page, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. I mean, it was interesting yeah. when um, I used to chair a, a board and, and you just made a brilliant point about what to do after the meeting was finished. Mm -hmm. And invariably, there were two guys who were brilliant and only used to speak when they needed to speak in the board meeting. 
But you know something? They were the first two people I would ring when I had a problem. Mm. When I had a problem that needed resolving from a governance perspective, they were the two people I would ring. One, they'd been through it. They had the grey hairs. They had the wisdom. And they were cleverer than me. Mm. And they had the knowledge. They wouldn't say much in the meetings. But I knew their value came in at five o'clock on a Thursday when I'd ring them and say, i got a problem here. Mm. And they were brilliant. Absolutely mm. brilliant. Okay. Know who you can count on. Uh, it's interesting that the, the quip you made here about being cleverer than you. Uh, Steve Jobs wrote an art, or was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review many years ago about his work at Pixar. Now, people think Jobs, they think Apple, and, and with good reason. But what he did at Pixar was equally phenomenal. Yeah. You know, and Pixar, as, under the Disney family, it's, it has grown. And he talked about managing creativity. And he made the point, never be too scared to hire people who are cleverer than you. Raise the bar. Raise the average. And far too often we feel a bit threatened or not sure this person will have value the board. And, you know, and, and you should... You know, don't be scared to get people who are cleverer than you. You raise the average. You just raise the average. And that's, and that's not a bad thing. It really isn't a bad thing. Well, people do fear that. Uh, I mean, you, you also talk about um, a chair, who, who, and, and you say brilliantly in the article where the chair is looking at an acquisition, and he opens up the discussion by saying, mm -hmm. I'm very excited by this proposal. Now, yep. you... you you contend in the article that that's a, a very loaded question uh, and that's something a chair, particularly a chair, shouldn't say. Well, what, what was no. the problem behind that? I mean, Linda, that's something which actually I experienced. I was asked to facilitate a board set. It wasn't, it wasn't a board meeting. It was a board always said uh, yeah. thing. And they wanted a strategic review. And kind of last minute, they shoehorn on the agenda and a proposed acquisition, which everybody was excited about. And when the chair introduced the agenda, the, 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 the proposed acquisition, that's what he said. He said, I've had a, a conversation with my counterparty chair. Uh, we seem to have a meeting of the minds. I think this acquisition will be great for us. We certainly can afford it. Okay, they could. And I'm very excited by it. By saying that, he had already said that I want to do this. The conversation has had been influenced. What he should have said is to say we've been approached. Uh, I think there's merit in us discussing this, and I really would like us to discuss, and then we'll continue the conversation. The second, the, in the second uh, stance, he he was he would have been neutral. So it, it it makes for a real really good open discussion. In the first stance, he had already said effectively, I want to do this. Now, the quid pro quo of this of the many qualities that chairs should have are basically facilitation skills, clearly, yeah? But far too many chairs forget that they are not simply facilitators. They are a fully-fledged board member. They have a view and yeah. they have an opinion, you know? And in some cases, possibly even a car. So, uh, so when the conversation has gone uh, full steam, I don't have an issue with the chair saying, well, I'm excited about this, but I'm just one. You know, the positioning is important. By putting it up front like that, and that person was quite influential. Yeah, he was a very nice man, by the way. You know, and there was no subterfuge in this. He was a clever guy, and, and it probably was the right acquisition, by the way. But the point is, the influence factor was wrong. And I did tell him afterwards, by the way, he was fine with it. You know, he, so, so, he said, so, so, so let me flip it the other way. Uh, I can I can imagine being in that position. I can imagine saying what you've just said, which is, mm. uh, by the way, we're looking at this thing. Mm. How how does a chair then respond if someone immediately says, "So, what do you think? Do you think it's a good idea? What should a mm. chair say then?" It's a very good point. And I think well, I think we need to discuss it fully because I'm here as a chair to actually get everyone's views on boards, you know, and in the throes of the discussion, themes will, will emerge, arguments will emerge, uh, risk will emerge, and uh, I'd rather keep my reservation my, or my, my opinion once we've had a full constructive debate. Then 
we have an informed body of evidence to actually begin to, uh, to make a decision. And, and, and back to your earlier point about confronting the judge with I think, mm -hmm. what about, and I've heard this a lot of times where people, board members or people in the team say, I've heard people say this about us. I've mm -hmm. heard people say this about the brand. I've mm -hmm. heard people say this is where we sit mm -hmm. with other brands. This is why we should, based on that, do that. What's, what's the rationale behind that? And what's mm -hmm. the problem with that kind of that kind of well, it, it, it could be right, but the kind of I have heard is a bit gossipy, you know. Or when people say, oh, "People are talking," or, <laughs> or they are there are murmurs of discontent, or or, or, or the kind of, the street talk is so and so. Okay, we need a bit more here. We really need a bit more here. You know, we need to actually window in and find out a bit more, it, it, it needs to be authenticated. It really needs to be authenticated. You can't just base a decision on, I have heard. Well, it, you know, it, it becomes gossip, you know, and, you know, with, with respect to, any, to anybody who watches the sitcom, I make the point, this is not EastEnders. <laughs> we are a professional board of people here. Forget gossip. This is not about gossip. I mean, for me, gossip, at a corporate level, is a form of terrorism. It yeah. can be so damaging. And often you can't see, you don't know where it came from, you don't know what, what, what are the objectives behind it, and they can cause so, so much damage if not put in check. So, well, this is a professional board. Uh, you, you may be correct. I, I'm not suggesting for one moment that you're not here, but we need a bit more on that, please. Has anybody else heard of that stuff? You know, is it, everyone shares the views of Linda here that these are the kind of conversations and then people will open up. Some will say, well, that's news to me. Others will actually, I heard so and so, you build the argument. So I have heard becomes we have a situation here. And, and, uh, and again, look at dynamics. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen boards where uh, people dominate ask lots and lots and lots of questions. Uh, and, and then there are other people um, who say nothing. But you say listening is not waiting to speak. <laughs> what do you mean by that when people are just listening? What, what did you mean by it's not waiting to speak? Well, you know, it's, it's the impatient in, in, in the human species, you know, in that uh, I've got something to say here and boy, oh boy, you're going to hear it. <laughs> boy, 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 you're going to hear it. So I wait for the first pause in your in your little sentence, even at the risk of interrupting your train of thought. But I'm going to get that in. And I think we should be better. I think all of us should be better. And you know, even in this little clip, I've interrupted you once or twice. My apologies. <laughs> so even even I'm guilty of, of my parable. But it, sometimes we need to be patient. Yeah, and just let you know uh, let let the argument come through. Maybe you wait for other reactions before jumping in and, and have a proper, proper, proper think. Uh, and if it's something contentious, ask yourself, well, why are they saying that? Why isn't this coming up now? And have some deep moments of reflection as to what lies. Ask the person to clarify a bit more. Ask the person to maybe authenticate the source of that in a kind of nice sort of way. And... Uh, because uh, people are impatient. Now, I see this a lot on boards of charities. So a board of chari a charity, say we'll have the good and the great from commerce and industry. And of course, the good and the great know everything about everything. You know, well, at Tesco, at Vodafone, at so-and-so. And you could see the other charity members thinking, well, wow, well, they must know their stuff. Just because they know stuff at Tesco doesn't mean it's going to work here. Basically, you know, and it's about being it's about being selective with knowledge transfer as to what may work and what may not work, and uh, so it's about being conscious. Sometimes just kind of just hold back a little, just hold back a little. I, I think that's a brilliant point because often I've met brilliant people, brilliant people, but Jean, they only know about their own sector. Take them outside the sector. I wouldn't call them hopeless. They're not hopeless, but their contribution becomes virtually nil. 
because they're so brilliant at their own sector. And I always say to people, it's great being brilliant in your own sector, but you need to know mm. about things outside your sector because yeah, that's when yeah. you can truly contribute because then, yeah. you know, you've got something to say that's different. Mm. <laughs> now, that's now, 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 just pick it up again, behaviour, dynamics in meetings. You, you use the word influence and, and, and you say it's an interesting skill to know how to influence but it's also interesting are you able to pick up that you're being influenced yeah. And, yeah. and and what are the telltale signs because they're both are linked so if you yeah. can pick up if you can pick up how someone's influencing you then yeah. i would thought in theory you'd know how to influence them so what sort of telltale signs are there that someone <laughs> is trying to get one over you mm. well I, I think it's 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 not it's not very visible uh not not too early anyway but it's continuous flattery, um, continuous smiles in your in your sort of direction, nods of the head whenever you say something, um, and uh, a non-verbal sound of appreciation, mm, you know, and all this thing kind of boosts your ego, and uh, they support you, and they actually say that they say, well, Linda. I am fully supportive of that. This is a really, really good idea. This, you know, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm totally behind you on this. And okay, sometimes that's merited, huh? yeah. But occasionally, that's the kind of, and these people are clever. That's the kind of tactic they use slowly, 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 and uh, they, they build you up. They flatter you, and it's subtle flattery. It's really subtle flattery. So, so how old are you? Fifty-five. Wow, I would never have said. Wow, I, I would I, I would never have said I would have said more kind of forty eight, ching boom, you know. And so I see that you sort of running a half marathon. Wow, that is really impressive. That you know the training you must do. So how, how you know? So I, I, look, there's a balance between taking a genuine interest in somebody's life, which is important, and maybe kind of being a bit too sort of swarmy in that. So all these things together, it it, it doesn't happen. It's not what what. Slow, they, they collectively kind of add up. And next thing, when that person wants your support, you feel obliged to say yes, because you know he's a nice guy, or she's a nice person, and she's always supporting me, and she always has my back, and it's my time now to actually you know, and reciprocate. So look, some of it is genuine. What I'm suggesting is, it's a question directors really ask of themselves. So, so, I so, so, so I think a chair has got to be it's going to be careful in the sense that they've got to encourage mm. and commend when good statements are said mm. without appearing to influence, but keep, keep that balance because the chair's role in that instance is important. They can't be, they, they've got to be seen to be encouraging, haven't they? To encourage yeah. people to say what needs to be said. Absolutely. No, it's a, yeah, there's, a, there's an old corporate governance joke. Yes, there are jokes in corporate governance, which goes, <laughs> not, which, which goes something like this. If two people always agree, one, one is superfluous. Oh, you don't need, yeah, yeah, yeah you, they both agree. You don't, you, you don't need to need one, basically. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but yeah, so, uh, and the, the quote of this in the article is that it's a question that when I ask other directors, they really struggle. You know, what, do you, what do you mean? When am I being influenced? Like, you know, so how do you, well, the point is they have not thought it through because they just have not thought it through. That people are actually trying to influence you slowly, slowly, cleverly, you know, and uh, these, some of these, some of these so-called board manipulators can be quite canny. They can yeah. be really, really, really canny. And uh, and it, it's the point I've, I've, I've told companies for years. Organizational charts lie because they don't tell you who's got the power. They tell you who reports to whom in nice little boxes. Otherwise, people get upset if one box is bigger than the other. Uh, but that is not reflective of the power structure in organizations. And a good chair, a good executive needs to sense that. Where does the power actually really, really? It's the Sir Humphrey in Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, a program that I never tire of watching the repeats. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It, it's ageless. It is. The script yeah. could apply to today. It is. But yeah. you see, you understand 
who really who holds the power here and so the manipulative cunning salami so so humphrey yeah uh, it's brilliant really brilliantly written but that the sir humphrey yeah yeah uh, you also talk about and um I think this is a very powerful point. You talk about the power of numbers yeah. and how some decisions are made in boardrooms or in senior leadership teams, but actually numbers don't even come into it. Yeah. So, so you used a point about Obama, a classic yeah. example of Obama. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can sort of just sort of repeat how that sort of yeah. sits. Sure, sure. Look, I mean, there's so much on this. I think any strategic decision People, the board, the collective body of the board needs to understand the financial impact of that decision. Uh, if something makes sense strategically, it has got to make sense financially. That's, that's just given. And far too often, that's not kind of fully grasped or fully understood. Okay, So that, that, that's one, one side. Another side sometimes is when, like the, 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 uh, the research argument that we, uh, that we had earlier, where, and this actually happened to me in a business. I was doing some work with them, and in the meeting, somebody said, well, our break even is X. Okay. And that coffee, not trying to be smug, I just didn't know. I said, well, you say break even is X. How, how do you actually get that figure? They just didn't know. Even the FD, to be fair, was quite new in town. Give him his credit. He said, well, I was told it's eight, and my predecessor was a good guy. Nobody had actually said, where do we get X from? So sometimes it gives false comfort, false assurance, and therefore, oh, okay, so that's that. But the Obama thing is about numbers bring a certain level of science to the conversation. Uh, the story of Obama, which is told in the great book by, by Tetlock and Gardner, Super Forecasters, which is a really good book and it's referenced in the article, when the American intelligence thought they had located bin Laden in Pakistan and they wanted to go in and demolish him. And these were the facts. What was known, whoever was in that compound did not want to be found. The curtains were always drawn. There was no satellite dish on top of the house. The front gate was always locked. The people never mixed with the neighbors which is, which is very anti the local community, where everybody knew everybody else. And also, whoever went in was always a single man walking in and walking out. So basically, whoever was in that building did not want to be found. It could have been some other criminal. It could have been a drug lord. So Obama asked his people, how do we know it's Osama bin Laden? Because I had to sanction invasion of a friendly ally. Because the... the intelligence on the person who didn't want to be found was robust, but was it Obama? That was less robust. So the discussion was behind circles and Obama apparently said, okay, I'm going to go to each and every single one of you here and I'm going to ask you for a number. How confident are you that the person in that compound is Osama Bin Laden? And he said that the answers ranged from 33% to 99%. And there was a wide range of opinions. And he admitted he took a calculated gamble. That he felt there was another, but it was a gamble. And my point about this is when somebody says, we think, I'm sure, to ask them to commit to a number makes them re reflect and makes them think. And you also, if that technique is used when it needs to be, you get into their heads. So when I go to a board meeting and I, and I want to put a proposal that I want to fight for, I'll think he's going to ask me about this. She's going to ask me for the financial impact. She's going to ask me how sure I am in numbers. So you, pre not that they get into your head, but in a nice way. It forces you to speak with authority or to rethink that said proposal. It, it brings a few, a few numbers. It brings a bit of science to the I think we should. And, and that can't be a bad thing. A, a final point about behavior, and then I've got just mm -hmm. a couple of other questions as well. Is you, you also say um, there's the long dance of avoidance 
and, and that's brilliantly articulated in the, in the article again. What, what did you mean by the long dance of avoidance? Well, a couple of things. One is obviously we don't want to, the, the, the famous elephant in the room or elephant in the zoo nowadays, you know, we, 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 we're just too scared to ask the difficult questions. We're too scared to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually working with a business now where closing a unit is a real possibility. It should have been done years ago, by the way. It is a problem. It has never made a profit. It is loss making now. It will continue to make losses. And there are, and, and there are kind of reasons. And I, and I told the MD, I said to him, do you want to have this conversation in a year's time? Because I've worked with you guys on and off for three years now. And this conversation, I can relate back to three years ago. Something's been done. So you, you need to make some hard decisions here. And getting consultants, people confuse activity with achievement. Just because I've actually uh, gotten some consultants to look at something, you, you haven't made a decision. <laughs> You've just outsourced the decision for a bit longer, basically. So it, 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 it's that problem. What I also mean is where, where we kind of, we hide behind words. And because I, I run courses on finance and somebody asked the FD a question and the FD says, it's for tax reasons. End of conversation. And my advice to them is, oh, tell me more. You learn something. <laughs> you know? oh, it's to strengthen the balance sheet. Ah, oh, it's because of the new accountings. Tell me more. So especially technical people have those little throwaway things. And again, it's no malice. They, they probably are correct, but directors don't question them. And if you don't question them, they'll carry on saying these things. Uh, but if you question them, they'll come better prepared next time. Tell me, I mean, this is all very, very in intriguing stuff, but I mean, I mean, one of the impressions I'm getting from, from what you're saying, uh, and I know you run courses in, um, in how to manage a board and meetings as such. Mm -hmm. I know you got running one in March with the Black Country Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. um, so are, are, are we saying that most meetings then, and most board meetings, whether they're led by governors or not, mm -hmm. actually they've not been trained. People have not been trained to, to understand how to run a meeting that is productive yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and in which people understand the start and the finish and what they're trying to get out of the meeting. And, yeah. I, and, and just to let you answer that, <laughs> I've seen examples of meetings where, from a governance perspective, they spend more time tactically than they do on strategy. And is that mm -hmm. because people just haven't been trained to understand yeah, what yeah. they should? <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, look, many board meetings are well, and of course they are but many board meetings or many meetings could be improved. And we've talked about many, many variables already in this kind of brief conversation. Um, I, I worked with a business in Birmingham actually once a few years ago. And in the conversation, somebody said, oh, board, board meeting is Monday. And I said, oh, any particular reason why Monday? No, we always have it on a Monday. I said, oh, any reason? No, it's Monday. And it turned out the non exec directors hated it because they're from all over the country. So they had to travel to Birmingham the night before. So it messed up their Sunday, it messed up their weekend. And there was absolutely no reason for it to be on Monday. But it was Monday. Crazy stuff. Great. So the date, the time, the venue, for example. Like a lot of us companies, if you have factories or divisions throughout the country or throughout the world, why not go and have a board meeting in one of your subsidiaries? Why not have the board meeting in one of your factories? Can you imagine what a powerful signal you're sending out? Then the entire board members can meet the factory people and vice versa. And it's just it's complicated, this stuff. Uh, AOB. And, and I call it the curse of AOB. Uh, <laughs> if you think about it, Linda, Unless something exceptional happened yesterday, AOB has no place on any, any agenda, in my view. If it was sufficiently important, it should have been an agenda item, but play along. We, it is what it is. If there are AOB, 
I think good practice is for the chair before the meeting starts. I said, right, can I have the AOB items now, please? Who wants to raise an AOB item and what are they? Can we go wrong? Because then people have the whole day to think. Because otherwise, 5.30, everyone's checking their watch. It's time to go, even in a Zoom environment. Uh, any other business? Uh, yeah. uh, yes, chair. Boom. Exocet missile. Nobody has a time to prepare. Uh, it, it, it comes out of the blue. It's, it's often showboating, attention seeking, and a good chair would, would kill that very, very quickly. So AOB, mm. you mentioned first. The, the order of the agenda. And the question I ask people is, are your agenda reflective of the environment or have they become ritualized? We always talk about operation first. We always talk about finance first. Yeah. yeah. So the order of the agenda items needs to change on a meeting by meeting. Because if you have a contentious item, yeah, if you leave that till last, everyone's mindset is waiting for that to come. And they can't possibly be engaged on any other. Any, so you put that first, because then it's it's it's, it's sorted out in, in in some form or shape. To leave the contentious uh, items like it impoverishes the other parts of the board meeting, because people aren't thinking about these things. And if anything, they'll rush it, because they really want to get their teeth onto that last agenda item. Uh, other stuff, as incredible as it may sound. Some boards don't make decisions. Yeah, I can believe that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Been there, yeah. Talk, talk a lot. Gosh, we talk oh, a lot. Look, and and you ever think, well, actually, what 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 did we decide here in truth? So it's not a bad thing on the agenda or the board papers, both to highlight these items for discussion, these items for decision, because then everybody knows. On this, we are going to have to make a decision here. On this, we have to make a decision, and don't ambush people. Uh, I see chairs do that. Uh, you know, especially if it's something contentious, and we may have to have a vote. A good practice is to say, "Look, okay, we've all said our thing here. We have a lot to digest. May I suggest a quick five, ten minute break? Go and have a coffee. Go for a walk. But when you come back." I will ask each and every single person for their opinion. Everybody will have a chance to speak. And when I finish with you, I finish with you. So give thought to what you want to say. Uh, because if somebody else is speaking, I will not tolerate interruptions. You've had your turn. So have a proper think. So let's have a really considered debate. Don't ambush people. Because that you know, it, it, it's not right. It's, a, it's not right. A couple of things, uh, and then, uh, crikey, it's almost 45 minutes. A couple mm -hmm. of things I just want to, yeah, I just want to pick up on. Um, you spoke very earlier on, and then we'll, then we'll wrap up. You spoke very earlier on about body language. Yeah. Did you remember about smiling and everything? If we assume going forward, particularly multi site um, operations and multinational operations, um, that people are going to start. I think, using a lot more Zoom than they used to. I think they're going to. I think they're going to. Do we lose something, you think, in decision-making through Zoom? Because, you know, you, you, you feel you can't interrupt someone because the way, you know, the technology doesn't work. And, 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 and of course, from a chair's perspective, I think it's great because if you say to people, oh, you're not going to speak until I see your hand come up on, on the Zoom and then or whatever software it is. So... So there's a bit more control, I, I think, because people know they have to wait till their mm -hmm. hands answered. Whilst it might be more control, are we losing out when it comes to body language and the fluency of, of, an, of a meeting? Undeniably. Undeniably. Look, this is, it is what it is, the virtuality. We, we, we've had to do it, and it will continue in many, many forms. But there will be interactions, and perhaps a board meeting is one of them where you want the people in the room. Uh, you know, if, and, and I get it, uh, especially if there are no major issues. Well, if, the thing is, up ahead of time, you won't know. But if there are no major issues in the company, 
they, everything is tickety-boo, there's nothing on the horizon, the numbers are okay, there's no kind of big risk, then on a virtual situation, perhaps it's okay. Yeah? But if we are to have tough discussions and tough conversations, you maybe need the energy. And I think that's where virtuality, we lose out on the energy. We lose out on the body language. We lose out on the corridor conversation afterwards. We lose out on the kind of one-to-one, -one, the fireside chats. You actually lose out on all that because they, as good as the platforms are and they are good and getting better, they can't possibly capture all these things because, because they just can't. I think the other thing that I've noticed um, is a lot more difficult, I think, to question uh, are numbers. And, and, and I think in Zoom, the numbers come and go and you can't really track them. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and part of, part of the problem with that, which is even more accentuated, is that uh, FDs tend to produce numbers that they think people want to see. Mm -hmm. But actually, people haven't got a clue. I, I, I used to chair one charity. I did it for two and a bit years. <clears throat> and um, I think it was about three months in. And I just turned to the board and said, I said to the board, do you understand these numbers? And these people have been sitting on this board for years and they said, we've never understood them. We've never understood the numbers. And I think you're absolutely right. I think in a Zoom environment, I think that gets even worse because they're just documents flying back and forth and you haven't even got them in your hand when you have sort of, but you know what I mean? And your chance of questioning people, I think is even, is even worse when it comes to numbers. Yeah. Well, you know, when... When I ask boards, or come, um, especially when I work with uh, mid-sized businesses or even SMEs, and I'm meeting, say, the founder or the chief executive, and let's say that person has a non-finance background, as many people do. They could be engineers, salespeople, logistics. I ask the question, do you accept that your finance director, if you have one, knows more about finance than you? Oh, gosh, yeah. So how would you know if he or she is doing a good job? How would you know? Like, you know, so the, the, the fun conversation. And I make the point when I've been on panels before where we look at recruiting a new FD. And when these people present their pitch, what I want to hear from them is I see it as part of my job to constantly educate and coach my board colleagues and present information in a manner which they will understand. That because because if you ask the question, they're going to say the right things. This, it should come from the heart. And a good chair will actually make sure that the FD does that. And some of the messages I've given to directors over years and years and years, and my course says is, A, it, you are well within your right not to understand, number one. Number two, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. I'm sorry. This is beyond me. Please speak to me as if I were a 15 year old. And a good FD would know how to decompose and explain something without losing the integrity of what you hear, he or she is saying. Because otherwise, bravado. And for me, one of the greatest skills of a director, executive or non executive, is humility. Is to put the hand up and say, sorry, didn't get that. I'm really so, so just, so just picking that up, uh, and we will wrap it up soon, is so you've seen over the years the evolution of the boards, how they've changed. You've said when somebody comes back to an organisation, it's not the same organisation they've come back to. Mm. So let me ask you, and I've, I've asked various chairs of boards and non-execs, in, in, your, in your mind, what sort of skill set should a NED have, a non-exec director, and how can you measure their contribution? How do you know this is a good non-exec because they've got this skill set? And how do you know after two, three years that actually they've been bloody good? Mm -hmm. uh, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Not that long. <laughs> uh, okay. Obviously, number one, curiosity. Okay. That's number curiosity. Curious, ask why, where, how, curiosity, independence commercial savviness, common sense, yeah. a, good, a good strategic antenna, good interpersonal skills, 
ability to communicate verbally and non-verbally very quickly and on the hop if they have to. I mean, non-exec directors are the black box of the company, the conscience of the company. It is they who should sometimes just pour cold water on some deals, maybe suppress the excitement a little, just as the Irish say, to be sure, to be sure, that when we make that decision, it, it's been the right call. But for me, it's about number one is the coefficient of curiosity. A non-exec director who has lost that curiosity is not no longer adding the kind of value that they should because they become native. They become native. And in the UK, the corporate governance code, admittedly it's for listed companies only, recommends that one should not serve for more than nine years as a non-exec. So it shouldn't, stay, shouldn't, shouldn't serve, serve for more than nine, nine years, yeah? Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. For me, you've gone native long before nine years. I, I don't know when that time is, but you've gone native. You've gone native. And a good chair should be able to spot that, that the range of questioning is a bit different. Maybe it's time for that person to move on even though the, it may only be two, three, I don't know, I don't know. The coefficient curiosity is number one. Once they lose that, they, 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 they are no longer adding value. And also, they, many of them try to relive their executive role. This is the one I was at. It's not what they're there for. It is not what they are there for. And particularly in a COVID-19 world, where some companies are bleeding cash and many regrettably will, will not survive. And you can understand how the board maybe needs to meet more often. The board need, need to be more supportive of management. I get that, of course. But at the same time, don't micromanage. Yeah. Support, but don't actually get in their way. Right? And the other point I've been telling people uh, in this COVID-19, especially if your business has been a savage, you need your FD to step up to the plate, big time, big time, if you're bleeding cash and if solvency is, is an issue. But do not let financial desperation replace strategic thinking. Because, you know, there will be opportunities. You, know, you may well survive. And the, the, the whole, and cost cutting is not a strategy. It, 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 it's something you have to do, of course, of course, sometimes. It is not strategic. So, so, and that's where you talk about dominance earlier. Whenever there's an economic downturn, the FD assumes more importance, and rightly so, by the way, and, and rightly so. But that level of dominance should still be kept in check. It was interesting observation I was watching yesterday. Oh, I can't remember what they call them mm -hmm. now. Facebook have set up a board that monitors content. And oh, they were talking, uh, uh, oh that's the one. They were, they, were, they, were, they were talking about what type of things would come in front of them for them mm. to have an oversight. Mm. And, and the questioning was quite interesting because they were really trying to say, actually, one, do you have any power as non-execs? Mm. Secondly, who are you being paid by? And, 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 and thirdly, what's going to be the impact? It was just interesting knowing that I was going to speak to you today, I was listening to the words that were coming out. And, and it wasn't very convincing, I must admit. It was yeah. almost at Facebook. Right, final question then. Fascinating yeah. session. Final question. Um, and they sort of both answered <laughs> Final question, two bits of it, but they sort of both answered it. Where do business leaders mess up in terms of their comms, in terms of the boards? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, who are the ones then? That really do get it right. So, who are the ones and why do they get it wrong? And then finally, who are the ones who really get it right? Yeah. I think leaders in, in all spheres of society, politics, business, fail to appreciate that their every word counts. People listen, watch them, listen to what they say, particularly in terms of uncertainty. Uh, COVID-19, etc., their words are amplified. And I think often business leaders fail to realize this. I think in controlled environment, business leaders tend to be very good. I've prepared a speech. I may well have rehearsed it, run it by somebody else. We, 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 we're quite good, but not. 
but where we really mess up are those impromptu conversation. The, the, the conversation in the car park, the conversation that we begin to ad lib. And if I go back to work and tomorrow and you're my chief executive and I say, oh, I spoke to Ninda on the plane yesterday and he said, the authority that that statement has beats any PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and it, and it, Ninda, it could have been just banter, basically. Yeah. It could have been just absolutely words come out. Trump hangs himself, and he's advised, as I'm sure, when he walks, or when he used to, when he used to walk from the White House to the helicopter and back again, he would hang himself in that moment. He would say some of the most, of all his stupid, stupid things, his pearls of stupidity always came from there, impromptu. And leaders mess that up all the time. All the time, they, they just, you know, they, they, they banter, they go off script, they go off piece, and people are listening. Uh, they don't know whether it's off piece or not. So, 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 it's the unguarded moment that often causes some. And we say words, that, and Linda, they're just words. They say things like, in all probability, when you preface something by that, you instilling doubt in what you're saying next. I did work for a bank once many years ago and I was working with what we call the directors of, they weren't main board directors, but they were executive in, 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 in all sense. And we had a couple of workshops with them. And in the one workshop, uh, in the penultimate workshop, I said, well, for our last workshop, be good to get the group CEO to come and talk to us. And there was a resounding, oh God, no, we don't want that. What? Why not? Oh, so we know exactly what he's going to say. I said, well, it's okay. So what's he going to say? Da, 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 da. I said, guys, this is good. This is really, really good that you don't want the CEO to come and speak to you because you know what he's going to say. That's not a bad thing. You know that. They thought, hmm, I haven't thought of it that way. Now, the trickier part was for me to phone, because they didn't know, but I had booked him already, for me to phone his office and tell his PA, Please tell the CEO he's he's not wanted, and and I gave the reason. But he did see the funny side of it, by the way. So thankfully, good leaders they, they are economical in their language. They're clear and they're simple. JFK put a man on the moon. Bill Gates a computer in every house. Simple. Obama. To be fair to Trump, he was very good at that. Yeah, yeah. Make America great. Jobs yeah. for us, drain the swamp. And he had five or six messages which resonated with America. And Clinton just missed it totally, totally, totally missed it, you know? So the, the clear, simple kind of messages. Uh, Mandela was very good at that. Very, but then he was a lawyer, very economical in his use of words. Muhammad Ali was brilliant. Okay, he had a script writer, so, so that's by the by. But what he said, Packed a punch, metaphorically, obviously. You know, so they are economical in their use of language, and after a while, people get it. You you are left in the, in, as to no uncertainty. This is where Thatcher was very good. You might not like her politics, but you knew where she was going. You absolutely knew where she was going. Other leaders. So, so I think almost that, almost to sum up then. When you talk about everyday communication, which includes meetings and board meetings, mm -hmm. it's clarity of vision, yeah. clarity of message, yeah. and clarity of purpose. So yeah. everybody in that room <laughs> knows why they're there, yeah. how they're contributing, and what the end goal looks like. Yeah. It's all yeah. down to what you've just said. Yeah, yeah. And you know, the, the example I give on my courses sometimes is this. Should the BBC have sacked Jeremy Clarkson of Top Gear? Ah, oh, good question. No, no, I don't know because I don't know. But can you imagine that board conversation? Look, out. You can't do that. But you could see how, I don't know if they were, but there could have been some voice who said, hang on a second here. We are a public broadcaster. This is a top revenue earner by a mile. Nothing even comes close. 
And who's going to suffer from this is license fee payers. You could see how a counter argument could have been put together here, but no, out. Don't care who you are, out. You don't do this, basically. Clarity, clarity of purpose. This is what this is about. And this, this is how we do things here. Um, there was a, a, a McDonald's when they fired the CEO the year before yeah. last. Yeah, I remember that. Successful guy. Yeah. And, 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 and the irony is, or irony, his successor has not changed his strategy one bit. So what he was doing was right. What he was doing was right. But don't do that. Sorry. Out. Don't, don't care who you are. Out, basically. So, yeah, you're quite right. So I, I, think, I think it's a very good summation. The clarity of thought, clarity of purpose, clarity of vision, clarity of direction, articulated very simply. You, you don't need more than that. You really don't need more than that. Well, Jean, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'm also going to wrap this up by saying I'm going to try and get a place on one of your courses because this sounds <laughs> absolutely <laughs> fascinating. And, well, you're and, very and, welcome. You're very welcome. Yeah, Jean, thank you for taking our time. I said it was going to be 40 minutes. Sorry. It's, no, it's no. over an hour. But I oh, think um, yeah. the response we got from the article was just phenomenal. And, and it was crying out for a podcast. Uh, and that's why I reached out to you. And, and, and to be honest with you, you've delivered brilliantly. So thank you very much. Have a great week. And, uh, and I'm sure everyone, when they hear this, will drop the appropriate comments. And I'd encourage anyone who hasn't had leadership training, whether it's in meetings or not, to always look at how they can improve themselves. And it's always good to learn from people better than you. Jean, thank you very much. 